Hi everybody, welcome to my DEFCON 29 Adversary Village talk. It's called Exploiting Blue Team OPSEC Failures with Red Elk. My name is Mark Smates and hope you like the presentation. I will be available in the uh, Discord room uh, or you can ask me questions any anytime later after the talk. Uh, you can hit me up via Twitter or some other way that you can can find me. Uh, so let's dive into the talk. Exploiting blue team object figures with Red Oak. A lot to uh, dive into. A little bit about me for who doesn't know who I am. My name is Mark Smates. Um, hobby wise, I'm from InfoSec class of 1998, professionally since 2006. Uh, and I have a very big background in system and network engineering. And from 2006, I've started doing pen testing. In 2016, I co-founded a company called Outflank, which you might know or might not know. Uh, my core roles in there are red team operations, uh, as well as building some tools and doing some of the trainings that we have created within Outflank. Mainly on the offensive side, mainly on the red side. I also have a, a little bit of experience on the blue team side uh, at uh, some of our clients where I had some threatening experience, which is actually pretty fun to do. So. That's me, the company Outflank. Uh, we are a boutique firm and we specialize in red teaming as well as trainings, mainly aimed for blue. Although nowadays we also have a red aimed training. Uh, and we have tooling. Since the beginning, since 2016, we have created lots of tools, given lots of presentations, uh, and the majority of our tools are available on our GitHub. Although during the time we have come aware of the fact that some tools are simply too powerful to be shared publicly online and that's why we have created just a few months ago our Outflank security tooling service which is basically our private tool set of all the tools that we use during our engagements that are too powerful to be used during operations. Heads up, those tools also integrate into what is Red Elk and that's where this is the topic of today. So. We're busting blue team, object figures with Red Elk. Red Elk is the tooling, and I want to dive through, well, the whole concept of Red Elk, what it is, why we have created it, and, and uh, how you can use it. Uh, and then, of course, there is the whole blue team side. And the blue team makes mistakes as well, object mistakes the same as Red Team does. So those are the main two topics for today. But before we dive into that broader sense, we need to discuss how we, and with me, we, I mean Outflank as well as myself, how we see red teaming. If there's one thing that I would like you to take away from this talk is that we believe that red exists solely to improve blue. Um, yes, we do simulated attacks, uh, but it's not a wrecking ball approach. It's not that we come by smash everything apart, uh, knock down the blue team, walk away, loot the gold and start laughing. No, no, far from. We see it as a sparring match. We see it as a training for blue, which means that it's fundamentally a different goal. Uh, we try to try to train the, blue, the weaknesses of the blue team and try to improve them for actually when the real deal uh, happens with the real attackers. Yes, our simulations, our red team engagements contain real punches, real movements. It actually may hurt both sides, um, but it's always better to have a practice hit on your face than a real hit on your face. So we exist to train blue. No wrecking ball. When we are talking about our boxing ring, if you like, uh, just a quick overview of how a modern offensive infrastructure would look like. Most likely yours looks about the same, conceptually wise, although there are many different technical bits and pieces. Going from right to left, we first have our own attacking infrastructure, where we have our command and control servers, multiple most likely. We have our delivery services, web servers, where we do tracking. We have all kinds of decoy things. We might have social media profiles, all on the true infrastructure that is on your own uh, span of control. On the complete left side, there is the victim network or the target network where you eventually have your implant running that calls back via HTTP or, or, or DNS or some other spooky protocol that you have, as well as internally within that victim network, uh, you've got your things running, your implants connected, things like that. 
In the middle, there is what we roughly call redirect characters or deflecting ways. It's in the modern nature of in the modern times with uh, uh, cloud-enabled infrastructure, it's very easy to have lots of yeah, flexible, disposable, resilient systems in there that is just simply a layer in between to obfuscate some of your own true attacking infrastructure, uh, as well as making some smart decisions in the, in the go. Nothing near here, I hope. But there is a reason that I'm telling you this, because this concept can become quite big if you count the amount of components that you have for your offensive infrastructure during your operations. So let's talk about a single engagement which might have several scenarios. For example, if you use a Tiber-based uh, approach for red teaming, you will have multiple scenarios within the same operation, which also means that you will have multiple C2 servers. Typical engagement for us, around five different uh, C2 servers. We also have multiple reader vectors, reverse proxies, things like that. Domain, domain fronting, CDN type of layers, multiple. You will be creating multiple fake identities to do, well, the, the whole social engineering thing. You might create a website, uh, one or two. Tracking pixels everywhere. We track everything, both in emails, as in delivery, as in multiple different aspects. Tracking pixels, tracking pixels, tracking pixels. You need to be catching them. You need to be setting them up. Uh, it's things to manage. And then on the whole delivery side, we got multiple web servers, multiple email boxes, maybe some file sharing services, messaging platforms, whatever all the new hot stuff there there is. But there's multiple aspects that you need to manage. That's all front facing. On your back end side, you will have. Generic backend components. Let's talk about communication channels that you have internally with your team or also with the white team. You will have your own test labs. You will have all kinds of log aggregation. Now, log aggregation is where Red Elk actually comes in. The reason I'm telling you this is that it. this is our boxing ring. This is what we need to use. Um, and it's becoming quite big per operation. And even if you have multiple operations at the same time which many red team firms actually do to keep track of that infrastructure is actually becoming challenging it's not something that it cannot be solved but it's becoming challenging so when we look at our infra offensive infrastructure we have two main typical challenges one being oversight the other one being insight with oversight, I mean just keeping track of where your infrastructure is, what the state of it, is it up, is it running, is it, is it okay, is it, uh, in some way you are hurting your own infrastructure, multiple components, multiple different things, multiple engagements altogether, a lot of data components to keep track of. Insight is more oriented on the fact, well, besides if it's up and running, is there data in there that can help us to do a better operation? Do we have the proper insight over infrastructure? Looking at other fields, we see quite a resemblance if you look on how those challenges are being uh, solved. So, if we look at cowboys, I just said the name, the term herding. Uh, to some extent, we need to herd our own infrastructure. And cowboys have the same way of herding their cattle. Uh, they use dogs to keep everything in control, and that gives them some way to well, manage the herd in that sense. Um, if you look at the inside, I'd like to refer back to Mr. Edmund Locard, which was actually the true Sherlock Holmes. He was a French, uh, the French Sherlock Holmes, and he was the one who put forensic science into the field of forensics. He was the one first to start measuring things, having forensic approaches to, uh, having uh, uh, academic approaches to, to forensic science, scientific approaches. Early 20th century, and why do I uh, bring in this guy into the talk? Because he's most famously known for his, his own, the low-cost exchange principle, which means every contact leaves a trace. And this is actually very much true for our own operation. As you know, every offensive action that we do, it will leave a trace on the system. It's up to Blue to digest, to see and digest and inspect the trace. But it's impossible to touch a system, to perform an action, to remotely do something without leaving a trace. But now it's the fun thing. It also goes the other way around. 
it's impossible for glue to do things without leaving a trace. So if you know where you need to look for, both blue side as well as red side, you can see actions of the other ones going. And if you're looking, if you're talking about traces by adversaries, by red teams, it's quite common to have a thing like a seam or have a security operation center or a cyber defense center or you, anyway, a team of people investigating traces and, and seeing things. The other way around, well, during our operations, uh, we were in need of such a thing. So looking at the tools that we had at ways, there is ways of hurting your infrastructure and we needed a way to actually do some investigation on our infrastructure. We started looking in the open source world and we didn't find anything and that is where actually Red Elk came about. Red Elk is a tool ready to be used, open sourced, uh, it's available on our, on our GitHub and you can use it for keeping oversight of your infrastructure as well as having insight into what is happening in the operation. And it's important to understand both aspects of this. Um, and Red Elk is during operation by us and by the other ones who use it most often used. Uh, you've got your live hacking console of your C2 infrastructure, uh, uh, your C2 server, your Cobalt Strike client, for example. You do your live hacky 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 commands. And then there is a second window open where you have the Red Elk interface, web interface Red Elk uh, available. And it helps you with just having well, the oversight of the operation inside, and you will see traffic data coming in, operation data coming in, etc., etc. Like I said, it's available on our GitHub, um, and I've written a few blog posts explaining why we need it, getting you up and running, and uh, achieving operational oversight, and in the next few months, there will be some more blogs probably coming out. Um, Red Elk, the name, of course, comes from Red being offensively oriented and Elk being Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, the technical stack that we choose for actually making this, uh, uh, this tool. So, diving into Red Elk. Um, looking at your infrastructure again, a uh, slightly different uh, uh, approach to this. On the uh, most left you have the target network. You've got your implant running, so there's attack and C2 traffic going first to your redirectors or your first line infra. Uh, and from there on, it's being filtered and it's being put on to your C2 service that you have in your, in your backend. Nothing new here. How does Red Elk fit into this whole process? Well, here you got Red Elk. It's in your local infrastructure. We have it on-prem. You could be running it in the cloud. We prefer to have it uh, on-prem. But there are connectors installed both on your redirectors as well as on your C2 servers. Data connectors, data feeds. We use FileBeat a lot. And from there on, it is put into uh, a logstash filtering and it's put into an elastic uh, NoSQL database. And Kibana is the interface, the web interface for actually searching through the data. And that goes both for the redirectors as well as for the C2 server components, or you could be hosting your own uh, website or whatever. You can pull the data and, and actually put it into the index of uh, Red Elk. And there's also data copy um, happening on the back end. So there are some rsync scripts happening to actually copy downloaded files to uh, have screenshots and all kinds of other operational data of your operation. Uh, you know, data of your operation uh, and pull it back to your central Red Elk server because well in the end you will have five six or whatever C2 service for a single operation uh, you do not want to be logging into every specific C2 server to search for that specific screenshot you want to have it all centrally locally in your Red Elk instance Red Elk does a few things. It indexes data, it enriches data that is coming in. Uh, it has lots of dashboards uh, in there. You can create your own dashboards and there's lots of search. Well, it's it's a search-based solution. Uh, so that's the core functionality of any uh, log stash or elastic stack. It's based on open source tools used so you can modify it yourself and change dashboards or whatever you can, you can are freely, free to do that for yourself. In recent versions, we have also added a Neo4j Docker instance, as well as a, Jup a Jupyter Notebook uh, Docker instance, uh, meaning that the Neo4j is used to import output from Bloodhound. So besides the Elastic Stack, 
you will have also a Docker instance with Neo4j, and you have a Jupyter notebook for quick searching through data. And this is really awesome because now you have operational data of your C2 infrastructure as well as from traffic data, but you also have knowledge about the Active Directory environment of your target. And by using the power of Jupyter Notebooks, you can make very quick queries on pulling data or matching data, both output from your C2 server as well as data that is within your Neo4j instance. For example, you could be searching for usernames that are uh, or, or new incoming beacons and uh, pick out the username and immediately go through your Neo4j instance and see what if this is a path going to actually domain admin or any type of, of admin group that you would like. And the Jupyter Notebooks is a way to actually quickly make those queries and have you quick uh, generate quick output. It's really awesome and once you get to use it, it's really powerful during the operation. That's the core Red Oak um, with both the Red Team and you might as well give the White Team some access to dashboards and as well as the whole, the whole interface. Uh, right now we mainly use have it for the Red Team uh, and we use Jupyter Notebooks to make data extracts that we can give to the White Team. But hey, do your thing, you can quickly give access to uh, to your White Team, give the White Team access to, uh, to Red Oak. Um, but looking at the oversight, there's still a target SOC or a SOC within the target network. And as analysts do, they start analyzing when they have a hunch of something that's going bad. So they are doing several things. They are in analyzing, investigating uh, your info. So they might be querying your specific redirectors uh, or they will put data onto what I call online security service providers. Think Spamhouse, VirusTotal, IBM X4, multiple di different domain classifiers, spam uh, uh, sandboxes, uh, all kinds of different ways of analyzing pieces of malware as well as infrastructure. Now it's the fun thing that those security service providers as well will be, there's, these are automated things, they start querying your infrastructure as well. So if you look at the log data of your redirector, you will see, you might have the option of actually having a, a SOC analyst investigating as well as some online security service providers. They might be investigating your infrastructure, they might be querying it, they might be looking at your specific URI path of your implant with different user agents, for example. And now we're getting into the whole seen part because if you have a big pile of logs about your operations c2 service as well as from your redirectors uh, traffic data you've got a big pile of logs and you have a rule based approach of looking for things that might be sus suspicious in your own data as well as querying online resources like virus total to see if an IOC of your own implant or your own uploaded file is already known at virus total, for example, well, all of a sudden you have a SIEM type of functionality. Um, so this is where Red Hat Flux fits in into the bigger picture. If you look at the logs of your redirector as well as your C2 servers, you will see that there's not that much data in there, so we will be needing to do some enrichment. And this is where, well, the data enrichment that we have with Red Hat comes in. We do multiple things. If we talk about uh, traffic data, we map it to GeoIP data. We check if it's a TOR-based address. We uh, take the ownership from IANA databases. We look at reverse DNS and all that type of data. We are put it into the same record and it's stored within the stack, uh, within the database. We also query gray noise, and for those who do not know gray noise, gray noise is an excellent tool for seeing if it's the traffic that hits you, if it's background noise of the internet, yes or no. Background noise of the internet is just the common scanners. Uh, could be Google indexing or could be common uh, uh, type of or, uh, C2 botnets. Uh, or it could be regular botnets that are just querying the, the, the internet, scanners, things like that. It is created for blue teams, but it's also for red-oriented uh, aim. It's also very interesting because if an address that is querying our infrastructure on a very specific path that matches or is our implant path, and it is not known by gray noise, then most likely you want to be aware of it, and most likely an analyst is actually looking into it, into looking into your operation. 
if it's just if it's known by gray noise, it's most likely just something like the background noise of the internet. Online resources we uh, can check at Harvard Analysis, for Aristotle, the abuse uh, databases, IBM X Force, multiple online resources that we can query and take data from and use that for enrichment of the data uh, within our uh, well, stack. And if you talk about C2 data, uh, there is a component within Red Hat that takes the logs from the C2 frameworks. It needs to be aware of how it is, the logs are being set up. It needs to enrich that, and that's what we do. We have full support for Cobalt Strike up to the latest version, as well as our own custom uh, Outflank uh, Stage 1 C2, which is also part of our uh, tooling offering. Uh, full support in there, and we are working for the other public ones. Posh C2 is let's say halfway, basic logs are being ingested, but the data copying of screenshots and things like that is not uh, yet fully done. About the same stage for, for Mythic. Uh, Mythic has created uh, an option, seam logging option, that you need to enable uh, if you install the, the team server. And from there on, if you install the Red Elk uh, uh, component, it actually takes away, uh, takes up the, the logs, ingests them properly, um, but there's no data copying happening on screenshots just yet, We're working on that. On the longer roadmap, we're also working at Covenant as well as Skite. And you are free to make your own, connect it to your own uh, C2 infrastructure or your own C2 uh, tool. Uh, in the end, it's just based on normal log stash rules. Uh, it's all open source and you can go nuts if you like. Okay, data enrichment. It's a lot about talking about what we do. Let's see how it works into practice. Let's start with the interface that you as a Red Team operator will see. And from there on, we go into investigation of our Blue Team's uh, Blue Team activity. First about, let's see how it works. Kibana is the web interface. And from here on, you just log in to the interface. Username, password, base. And from here on, you will see that it's a normal Kibana interface. Uh, and we have several pre-made views for you that are most often used, meaning that it has the right columns and the right names and the right filters already made. So I click here on the redirect traffic, meaning that it will give you a tabular view of, in this case, the last seven days of traffic that came in on anywhere where the data is being uh, taken from. You will see that there is a timestamp and a tag scenario, the backend name of the redirector, uh, the redirector traffic source IP, uh, source DNS, and the actual HTTP request. The attack scenario is an important one because during an operation you will most likely have short haul, long haul, or scenario one, scenario two, scenario X if you're using a Tyro, so multiple scenarios during that specific attack. And all the other names actually make sense if you look at the specific index that we're talking about. So if we talk about redirected traffic, let's go actually use that. So let's filter. This is just normal Kibana interface stuff. Let's filter on only seeing attack scenario a short haul. You can expand uh, the, the, uh, the data component or the, the object, and you will see that there is GeoIP data being enriched. You will see the full log message as it was provided within the, uh, the log. And you will see several aspects as in the actual IP address of the font address, the, 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 the name that you use, that, uh, the, uh, the reverse proxy name, so the front end name. Um, the program that was used in this case was Apache. Uh, you will also see that it knows how to digest the different headers. In this case, it makes sense because it was done via a CDN network. Uh, and the CDN actually puts in the proper uh, X4 to the 4 headers, etc. That's being taken up by Red Elk and it replaces to have, have the proper source IP address in there. Lots of chopping data in there happening and it presents to you an easy and queryable interface. If we talk about C2 logs, so no traffic logs but talking about your own C2 logs, then we have the same approach. It's still the same. Uh, division between multiple attack scenarios. You will already see that there is a target username, target IP, inter IP inter internal IP address, hosting, things like that. Um, that is the normal log message from uh, Cobalt Strike, and you will see that for every action within 
uh, cold strike being done. It has mapped the data from the top line being the username, uh, IP address, etc. You can click on the link to have the full beacon log, and which most of often can be pretty big. And from here on, within your browser, you can just simply control F to do quicker viewing. Uh, sometimes just having such a beacon log in text base is actually easier to use than the Kibana interface. So from the Kibana interface, you will have immediately just clicky, uh, you will have the actual beacon log. Same goes for the other C2 frameworks. Now, in some cases, you have during your operation, you have made multiple screenshots and going uh, back, you will remember, well, there was this one system where I had a screenshot that kind of looks like uh, it had this specific application in there. Well, Kibana or Redux has an interface with quick previews as well as full click to full resolution uh, screenshots uh, more directly available to your web interface. So because it's pulling from all the different team servers, there's no need to log into all the different team servers. The same approach goes for keystrokes as well as downloaded files. Another one is a central overview of all your IOCs. As you know that Couple Strike and any other C2 framework will, will generate an IOC, an indicator, uh, that is being adjusted. And from here on you have that view, you can search through it, but with the uh, uh, power of Kibana, you also have the option to quickly just export the data and present it to your white team. So you go to share, you will click on CSV report, you will generate the CSV file. It will take some time, but now the Redux interface or the Redux service is making the interface, uh, the file for you. And it's just a CSV based of the tab that you see right now. The same can be done with Jupyter Notebooks, but from here on, it's just a, a quicky, quick, click, clicky way of uh, having the data in there. Easy to use. This is about operation. Uh, might be already that you think, well, this might be useful for your operation. Well, I hope you do because it actually is really useful during your venting operations. Let's talk about spotting blue team activity. There are multiple ways or multiple areas on where we could be spotting any action of, well, uh, action of a blue team and where they leave traces. I'm talking about directly to your info, so traffic that is directly hitting your offensive infrastructure. Got a few examples in here. We also have got indirect, where we are querying online security service providers uh, for any blue team activity. And then there's a third category where we're talking about internal checks. So checks that your implant that is already inside the, the net target network running, it can do some queries. And if it's doing the proper queries, you will might spot some activity of the blue team. Some of these are fully included into Red Elk. Uh, some we are working on and some are for a longer approach. But first I want to talk about the concept and then we can talk about the specifics that are implemented in Red Elk as well. And if you believe that we are not quick enough with development, it's an open source project. Come join us, come help us. We need to discuss how the redirectors make the decision and how Red Elk feeds into this. So when we're talking about traffic that is originating from the actual implant, um, that's one way. The other traffic that might be hitting a redirector is non-target related. Could be scanners, could be just a regular internet traffic. Your redirector makes a decision based on whatever rule you put in there. So this is just a HA proxy or Apache or any way that you configure your, your reverse proxy. And it will make a decision to either forward that session to your backend, your true C2 backend, or a decoy website, or forward it to a different website. The logs that are being put out by HA proxy or Apache or NGINX or whatever reverse proxy that you use, those are being ingested by Red Elk and you will you saw them in the interface. But for Red Elk it's important to have the proper logging. So when you do the installation, you actually need to change the logging of your uh, reverse proxy tooling. But there are also specific uh, requirements for the naming of your backends. If you rather need to be aware of what is a decoy and what is a C2 backend. So any type of C2 could be or should be named with C2 dash whatever. Any type of decoy or deflecting should be starting with decoy and dash and then whatever. Based on that decision, Red Elk will also help you with alarms. The redirector is making decisions, that's important. 
Okay, once you have up that up and running, you will see in the interface of Red Dog that, well, an analyst might be connecting to your infra. Could be, well, eventually being uh, routed to a decoy website or both to, or, or to a C2 backend. And especially traffic going to your C2 backend is interesting. And more than once you will see, or at least we have seen, and I guess you will be as well, that uh, when a blue team is doing an investigation, manual investigation, they are using Python or Curl or maybe PowerShell. Or, and not very, <laughs> not every time, they will be changing the actual uh, user agent. So well, you will see Python user agents coming in. And more than once we have seen that they first tried it from their breakout point of their uh, SOC uh, internet uplink, but also maybe via a Tor address. So multiple ways that will be querying your, and depending on the actual path and the backend that is being chosen by a redirector, this is interesting to see, well, is there any happening, uh, any investigation going on. Another one that once you have the logs uh, in there uh, is interesting to see is that if they are, the blue team is sharing uh, the URL of a thing to be investigated, some instant messaging clients actually try to preview that specific uh, uh, website. So in this case, it's an example of Telegram, but all the other ones are basically the same. Um, they will try to make a preview. And as you type, they for every new character, they will be trying to get a preview of the host. So they will be connecting to that host. Interesting to see. And a clear indicator uh, if, well, you see these types of uh, instant, instant messaging apps with a user agent come by and querying your C2 backend infrastructure. That's interesting. So that's directly oriented at your own infra. Let's talk about indirect, so via online security service providers. What I'm showing you here is the interface that a blue teamer would have, in this case for a semantic, uh, the ADR product, semantic ATP. And I've highlighted those little checks or options where it says submit to sandbox or submit to virus total. Well, you might think that's not smart to do because once it's in virus total, it will have a hash and we as a uh, red team, we know the hashes over our pieces of malware so we can query virus total. Well, have you got results for this specific hash? And virus total will tell you no, it's not. Or if it's there, then most likely as we have not uploaded the malware piece ourselves, the blue team has, and then there is a big indicator that you have been compromised, that the attack is compromised. Any blue team should know this, but it's made very easy for them to still click on that button. This is Symantec, this is Microsoft, uh, the WDA ATP, so the Mara Protection Central Portal. There is a check for virus total, and there is an option of clicking it to, or submit it to their deep analysis, which is just a sandbox. It's made very easy for them to click on those links. Talking about sandboxes, um, you could be deflecting traffic from your or coming from sandboxes based on source IP address uh, to a specific decoy uh, backend or your redirector, or you ju could just let them come in. Either way, you could be check the characteristics of that AV sandbox connection uh, and have an alarm in there, uh, having a clear indicator. So. Doing some tests during the training uh, that we did, uh, this is just a mapping of, I believe it was over an eight hour period when on purpose we actually tried to hit sandbox connections, just to have a bigger data set of how sandbox connections looks like. And this most likely maps back to your own experience that you might have with a sandbox connection. The funny thing is that they are not very creative with the naming. So on the right side, you will see the actual names of the computers. And on the horizontal bar, you will see the different students that they have tried to, uh, and, and the amount of new AV beacons that are connected. So let me just zoom in. You will see the names that you will probably recognize. Admin PC, John PC, Tequila Boom Boom, Virtual PC, Admin Dash something, Win Dash, all the typical uh, Windows evaluation uh, images not very creative. So this is a clear indicator, uh, which of course you already know, is that there is something fishing going on. But we can also generate alarms based on this, even if it's not going back to the uh, C2 backend. Another one that I want to highlight is domain classification. Here you will see 
Relog already does this. There is a config file where you enter domain names, and from there on, well, in this case, I entered outflank.ml, and it's querying IMTM Xforce, McAfee, as well as Bluecode in a periodic way. And you will see that for some reason at IBM Xforce we have uh, an error getting a reputation, but that's okay, we still have two left. And what's interesting here to see or to look for is changes in those classifications and to see if it's actually a bad reputation, so if it's a rogue type of thing. We went through all the different data or the different classification groups uh, that those uh, domain classifiers have. We picked out the, the, the rogue ones and uh, as soon as there is a mapping of your domain into one of those categories, you should be getting an alarm. Interesting other area we can do spotting blue activity is on the internal. So checks on the internal way of coming from your implant on the internal network. And let me give you just a few examples. First of all, the damn nasty Caribbean TGT. Many networks still have not an automated way of changing the password of the Caribbean TGT. So if you come into a network, and you will see that in this case, even 2010, the last password set of that specific account was 2010, and later on in your operation, all of a sudden it's being reset, well, chances are big that it was a blue team initiated change. So the Caribbean TGT is very specific, but you can use the, 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 the same thing for specific admin accounts or other accounts. And it's hard to judge when a normal password change would be, but if you have five admin accounts and all of a sudden they are changed in the last day, it's a clear indicator that, well, if all admins start changing their passwords, they are onto something. So blue check is an, uh, a thing that helps you with actually outputting this information. It's a, uh, it's a com based thing that communicates via Etsy um, and it outputs in a certain way that Red Dog actually is able to ingest. I'm not sure if we have open sourced it just yet. How about certificates? Uh, here we do a SEFT check for a specific website, our Outflank.nl website, and this check gets the data from the certificate out. It checks to see if it's being SSL intercepted or if there's a, a SSL intercepting a corporate proxy in a way. If this changes during an operation, then the blue team has well, enabled SSL interceptions, which they might often not always do from the beginning, and it's a clear indicator that, well, something has changed, you need to be aware of, of blue team investigations. Okay, as a summary, if we're talking about direct-based types of inf indicators of investi investigation, or maybe we should call it indicator of analysis or indicator of detection, I don't know, I don't care, uh, but if we look at the directly-based things, we can check for analyst traffic, so specific Tor IP addresses, curl user agents, uh, that are going straight to your C2 backend, that's a clear indicator for analysis. Deflected traffic, huh? for some reason your redirector logic has said, well, we need to deflect this to our decoy website or some to other uh, thing, uh, we can make alarms based on that. Blue code, other specific security defenders have very specific ways of querying your infrastructure. And you can have insight into the data, and later on we can have alarms on that as well. It's messaging I show you. A funny thing is if you have if you know the IP ranges of blue teams, uh, which you might know over some time, uh, if those IP ranges are connecting to your infrastructure. And even if they go to a decoy, if they are going to deflected decoy backend, or if they go to your true C2 backend, you want to be aware of any type of blue team IP address accessing your infrastructure, because it immediately uh, is, is that uh, suspicious. And then there's generic C2 scanners and AV sandboxes. Having Red Dog, you will have proper uh, inf uh, insight into what those C2 scanners are doing and where they're coming from. Not directly alarm related, but it's very helpful to have that insight. That's on the direct traffic. If we talk about indirect, we're talking about AV hash. Let's check virus total, hardware analysis. But it's also an infra blacklist. So if you have configured to Red Dog, if they are, if it's aware of you know, the URLs that you use, if, the, if you're aware of the IP addresses of your infrastructure, specific TLS certs, so the, the, the hash of your cert, 
we can check that data onto well, public lists of known IP, bad IP addresses, URLs, and certificates. And the domain classifiers I already showed you. Looking at the internal side, uh, we can check for the password resets, the TLS interception. Another one that we have already included is the uh, security tool checks. So an unexpected change of the EDR tool is being installed. Um, that's a clear indicator. All of a sudden, they have done something for more investigation. We are working on checks for log forwarding, security config, as well as accounts login, where we log forwarding if there is a change, all of a sudden WEF is being enabled or uh, WinLogB is being enabled, things like that. It's a clear indicator that something has changed that you need to be aware of and most likely is related to Blue Team activity. We can check for six, uh, very specific security config changes. Um, this is a very broad topic, but it is a category that needs to be mentioned. So if you have an implant doing some checks and all of a sudden well, you can check many different security parameters, uh, local security policies, and if those change, why would they be changing during operation? And then there is um, an unexpected change of the accounts are logging in. If you land on the box and if you go through the Windows event view of the past uh, 10 logins or the past 100 logins, you will most often see a clear approach of what accounts are logging into this machine. All of a sudden you see service accounts uh, logging in or all kinds of different things. It might be aware, it might be an indicator for you that you're not as stealthy as you think. How to get started? I um, need to tell you a few things. On the planning side, a Red Elk installation is intended per operation. Could be having multiple scenarios, but it's for one client if you like. So do not mix client. Do not make a central Red Hat server where you put into everything together. You want to nuke the system because it, can't, it contains highly confidential data. You want to nuke the system after the operation. It has three million components. The Red Hat server itself, a connector that you install on your C2 servers, and a connector that you install on your redirectors. There are several important identifiers used during the operation, and you want to make them clear at the beginning of your installation. That is the attack scenario name that you use, as well as the component name that you use. So the component name is interesting or relevant for the C2 service and the redirectors, and the attack scenario uh, as, uh, as well. Those are also parameters that you need to put onto the installer on the C2 server as well as the redirector. An important thing to know, and I mentioned it before, is that the default logging of Apache or HA proxy or your, any type of other uh, reverse proxy is not sufficient. We've put on the wiki, which is on GitHub, and, and both on the, on the blog post series, we have told you, or we put examples, configs in uh, the Red Hat code as well, how you change the logging to be specifically ready for Apache, to include header uh, uh, logging and uh, explicit names of the front end and back end, and things like that. It's already in there, but you need to enable it, otherwise, well, Red Hat is blind for traffic data. Then you do the installation, you get the latest release on GitHub, or you can just try the master branch, whatever you like. Then there is a first step in creating certificates and the installation packages for both the Elk server, the C2 server, as well as the redirector. You do that with the initial setup. You generate certificates that are being used for the transport of the data from those other components back to the Red Elk server. It's encrypted, TLS encrypted, you need to configure that. And from there on, you run the installers on your readers, on your C2 servers, as well on the main Red Hat server. And very important, uh, there are post-installation uh, 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 configurations that need to be done. And you will find that on the Elk server at the, that specific part that you will see there. There you enable specific alarms and uh, other kinds of things. And it's all explained into the, uh, the documentation that we have, both on GitHub as well in the blog post series. A little bit about the roadmap, uh, version 1, which was 2018-2019, I believe, we focused mainly on oversight and not very much on the alarms. We had support for Corporate Strike, HA Proxy, and as well as Apache Redirectors. Uh, but version 2, where we've been working on since 2019, I believe, um, it's at uh, it's still a better stage, but almost there. It's a major improvement both on the setup, but most, uh, majority on on the types of alarms as well as the updated and supported tech. So lots of more C2s uh, supported, partially too. 
but also Nginx uh, and our own uh, C2 framework. Uh, and of course, like I mentioned, we have the integrated Neo4j and the Jupyter notebooks. It's in constant development, more alarms, more uh, improved dashboards and things like that. And we're also working on other C2 frameworks. And you're happy to join us if you like. In summary, we believe red teaming is to make blue teams better. That's why we do proper sparring. Uh, and we having that insight of movement of your opponent during a sparring uh, fight is actually better. So red dog helps you with that specific case, it will help you to uh, see activities that the blue teams are doing. And dear blue, think of your OPSEC. You can make use of Red Elk, you will find it on our GitHub, and you will find information about this also on our blog. And with that, I would like to thank you for your time.